It says in the first of Samuel that he lifts the beggar from the dunghill and makes them princes unto God. I remember about 15 or 16 years ago when we were working with Dave Wilkerson in those days when David was hardly known, and yet we had a full house. This side of the prayer chapel was filled with girls, this with men, and a little fellow stood up and he said, Brother Raven, let's come to preach for us. A little Puerto Rican fellow, his face was radiant, and he said, before he sing, we stand up and sing. Sing the national anthem. Oh, I thought, baloney, sing the national anthem right before I preach. I didn't get what he said. He didn't say sing the national anthem. He sing our national anthem. He said, we sing our national anthem. So I thought the Puerto Ricans must have one. And he stood up there and you know, he started to sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. It was grace that taught my, it was grace. And you know, before we got to the end, when we'd been there 10,000 years, he changed it to 10 million. Well, it wasn't bad, 10 trillion would have been better, but <clears throat> he, 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 he got there, and you know, there wasn't a dry eye on those, those girls who had been prostitutes. Some of them had carried guns. Everyone had been pitched. The tears were flowing. They used to make other people weep. Now they're weeping. Why? Amazing grace. Isn't it staggering how, how, how far this amazing man went? Look at his missionary journeys without airplanes, without trains. God put something in him. The stupid world tried to get it out of him. But God put something, something in him. And, and they lashed him 195 times. And they couldn't whip it out of him. And he hung on a piece of wood in the Mediterranean for 36 hours and they couldn't wash it out of him. And they tried to threaten it out of him. But Almighty God put something in there, you see. They were not trying to kill the Apostle Paul, the idiots. They were trying to kill Jesus Christ. Because Christ lived in him. And he says, I don't know whether to desire and depart or be here because it's not much better off up there in one sense. I still got Christ inside. You talk about the fullness of God. What, what Paul did, you know, right after he was born again, after that miracle happened on the Damascus Road. I'm glad one man stayed to listen what God had to say that morning. He didn't just pray. He listened and God said, Ananias, get up and go to the street, go straight, and that's the house. Isn't it great to know that God knows your name and address? Postman may forget it, but God knows it. And he goes down and says to him, Brother Saul, that must have startled him. I mean, he was going to kill that man. And he goes and says, Brother Saul, the Lord hath appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister. And you know, only God can make you a minister. Nobody else can do that. They may teach you a few things in Bible school, but they never make you a preacher. Paul has no fear. Do you know what he did? I would to God some of you fellows would do it. Do you know what he once did? He said, I bow the knee to the Father. And because he bowed the knee to the Father, he never bowed the knee to anybody else. Neither demons or politicians or kings. He stood there, regal. Isn't it something that there's a, a man there, suave, and in his gorgeous robes and his uh, beautiful rings, and all society gasping when Felix walks in? Before he finished, Felix's knees were knocking together. He, it says Felix trembled. He goes to one of the most distinguished men of the day, and what does he say? You almost persuade me to be a Christian. I'm on the very verge of it. Paul says, I would to God that you were even as I am, except for these chains. <coughs> Isn't that lovely? He has his chains on. The difference between Paul and the man on the throne, the man on the throne had chains, but they were on the inside. Paul's chains were on the outside. He had none on the inside. He was free. Free from the fear of men. Free from the fear of consequences. Free from anything the devil might put on him or other people. From henceforth, he says, let no man trouble me. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I'm afraid that Paul would look on with compassion and real pity on our feeble faith. I sometimes say this is a day of thin theology and fat preachers. And I'm sure it is. 
There's no sentimental Christianity with the Apostle Paul. There's no such thing as coming to the cross and just getting your sins forgiven. Oh, no, 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 no. The man who only wants his sins forgiven is trifling with Christianity. He needs more than his sins forgiven. He needs more than that, that horrid record. Maybe you sin enough to damn a thousand people. And God in his infinite mercy, when you confess and you plead and you're broken hearted and you're penitent and you repent, he takes that record and flings it into his eternal backyard is like never to be remembered against us anymore forever but man needs more than forgiveness he needs cleansing he needs more than cleansing he needs indwelling he needs to get to read to the bondage of sin he becomes a bond servant of Jesus Christ now I said Paul came to the in the intellectual capital where they worship the brain and he came down to Corinth where they worship the body The continual talk in Athens was wisdom. The continual talk in Corinth was wickedness. I, I don't read he sent out a letter asking for support to get there. I don't read he made reservations in the Holiday Inn or somewhere. This man is prepared to follow the step of Jesus every way as far as possible. Somebody said to a friend of mine recently who might be doing some building for God, he said, listen, let me give you a word of advice. Don't build anything that will embarrass you in a few years. That's a very good point. I see God's money going in stately buildings and swimming pools and tennis courts and I want to vomit. With the world starving, with the mission field needing money. Paul attacks Corinth. Well, uh, he, he doesn't go with his philosophical stuff. He, he doesn't dazzle them with his knowledge. He says, listen, he begins the epistle, doesn't he, by saying, uh, I, I'm not coming to you with enticing words of man's wisdom. Uh, almost saying, I just tried that out at the last place, and those, those philosophers and Stoics and Epicureans and others, they, uh, they marveled. They opened their eyes. They, they were staggered by what I said, but I didn't get through to them. And so I'm going right back, back, back to the foundation. The most precious thing we ever handle is the human soul. The Pieta one day will go up in dust. The Sistern Chapel will be blown to smithereens. But the soul of a man will live forever and ever and ever and ever. Either in eternal darkness or eternal bliss. Heaven is impeccable joy. There'll be no sorrow. Hell is eternal misery. There's no joy. There is only one way to heaven. There are a million ways to hell. What do you do to go to hell? Nothing. Just do nothing, that's all. You don't have to thumb your nose at God. You don't have to blaspheme the name of Jesus. You don't have to be adulterer. Just coast on. For the greatest sin in the world is not adultery. The greatest sin in the world is I can manage my life without God. That's the greatest thing. In America alone right now, we have, I dare to say this before God, I believe we have hundreds of millions of gospel cassettes. And we have millions of gospel books. And we have hundreds of Bible schools. And we have hundreds, over the year, we have hundreds of seminars. And we have people memorizing the scriptures. And we have about 5,000 radio stations who every day give some part of the scripture. And yet with all this stuff to feed on, dear God, where are we with all this stuff to feed on? 95% of us are spiritual cripples. Spiritual infants. Spiritual babes. I don't believe the Church of Jesus Christ has ever faced the hostility. I believe the world today and in areas of the church is filled with lying spirits and doctrines of devils. Paul is jealous for the old rugged cross and you remember what he says? There are some people who are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now notice what he says. He doesn't say they're enemies of Christ. Oh no, they're smart enough to use the name. The Mormons use the name of Jesus. The Mormons say they have gifts of the Spirit. The Jehovah's Witnesses talk about Jesus and the Kingdom, that they're enemies of the cross. It's the blood that is an offense to them. 
They are enemies of the cross of Christ. I wonder what it say in our day. I say going down the streets in Athens, his spirit was stirred. He was angry. Babies, children, full of self-pity, self-interest, self-seeking, self-concern. Me first. You say sometimes, I wonder God doesn't burden me. Do you know why? Because he can't trust you, that's why. You're not strong enough to carry the burden. Oh, it's easy to be emotional. There's nothing wrong with emotion. You've got to have some emotion. But it's wrong when that's all there is. Children, they love people, but they only love emotionally. Who do they love most? Oh, Auntie Bessie. Of course, her sister's a far nicer personality, but her sister happens to be poor. So when they hear Auntie Bessie comes, they climb up at the windows. She's coming, she's coming. Why? Because she always brings a gift. And they just love her on that basis because she gives and gives and gives. And some people love God because he gives. We've got this wretched prosperity stunt. Paul's very clear, isn't he? Doesn't, doesn't he say, oh, well, writing to Timothy there, that you'll come a day when people think that gain is godliness? Some of God's choices saints don't have another shirt to change. There's only one power that can withstand the onslaught that's on all the nations of the earth right now. And that is the church of Jesus Christ anointed with the Holy Ghost. And there's an old saying that all is fair in love and war. <clears throat> and I'll tell you what, if you stir hell up, he'll, the devil will stir everything he can against you. You'll get misunderstood, misrepresented, and if you're not thick-skinned, no, 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 it's not if you're thick-skinned. If you're not mature enough, it'll get you down. It's not the contradiction of sinners that gets you down, as Psalm 1 says. It's the criticism of saints that gets you down. Eli thought that Hannah was drunk. Sure she was drunk. She was drunk with God. She was intoxicated. She got through to God. He was going to remove her barrenness. Paul's blind. He says, I see neither Jew nor Greek nor bondman nor freeman. If I see a king and he has a gold crown and all his ritual, so what? In the sense of him, he's dead. Because you see, there are only two kinds of people in the world. Those who are dead in sin and those who are dead to sin. I'd like to see a bunch of men go and say, say I'm going to say in, say somewhere like, uh, but go into a city like Finidid and say, I'm not moving out of this city until there are two moves. Until God moves and the devil gets out of the place. We don't have anybody like that. We fly by night. We want our big love offerings. We want glamour. Paul never glamorizes the gospel. It's a pretty gory gospel. It's a bloody gospel. It's a sacrificial gospel. I believe the cardinal ethic of Christianity is sacrifice. Not success, sacrifice. Five minutes inside eternity. I believe every one of us will have wished that we'd sacrifice more. Prayed more, loved more, sweated more, grieved more, wept more. 